Sasquatch was born in early June. Proud parents, Bug and Big T. The chick's gender will not be released until November. That's when staff will be able to do a physical exam and receive DNA results. This dry run at swimming was a huge success. Latrice said be sure to tell you so long. Here are David and Seth. Craig, thanks. Here's what's coming up on Eyewitness News at 6. I really didn't know what happened. I thought maybe it was a drug bust. A neighbor's perspective of an officer involved shooting in East Ridge will tell you what police say about the incident today. This dog was left in a garage li given little food to survive, but the Humane Society says no charges will be filed. How instead officials hope to give families resources to better help animals in need. And later at 6. We've been electrofishing today with TWRA and TVA. Find out how it helps monitor the health of waterways in the Chattanooga area. With coverage you can count on, this is Channel 3 Eyewitness News at 6. We're hearing from Chattanooga's acting police chief for the first time tonight on what he plans to do if approved. I'm Cindy Sexton. And I'm David Carroll. Council members must vote on whether to appoint David Roddy as chief next week. Today, they held a question and answer session to find out if Roddy is indeed the best man for the job. Channel 3's Kate Smith was there. And Kate, tell us what kind of questions did they ask? Cindy, lots of different questions were asked this afternoon, including diversity in the police department, police retention, and internal affairs investigation. It was the first time that acting chief, David Roddy, addressed the city council since being appointed by Mayor Andy Burke. One by one, council members addressed concerns from their constituents. A hot topic, community policing. Here's what David Roddy had to say about his vision of working with the community. You have the, the theory of community policing, which is the relationship between law enforcement and its community members. And that is the deliberate efforts that the department is making now, and then what those efforts look like as we continue together. It's the deliberate efforts of the front porch lineups. It's getting officers out of their cars to where they can engage. It's, it's not a, a wave from a front porch. It's a handshake and a conversation standing in the yard. Chief Roddy expressed that he will keep a lot of programs that are already existing at the department, but he also has a lot of new ideas to bring to the city to improve it. Council is about to accept the nomination at any minute now, and then later next week they will give the official yes or no to name David Roddy as Chattanooga's top cop. Now, of course, count on us to keep you updated throughout the process. But for now, live in Chattanooga, Kate Smith, Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Okay, thank you. The reason city council members are choosing a new chief is because former chief Fred Fletcher retired last month. He was sworn in as chief on June 11, 2014, following a national search. Fletcher was chosen from a field of 77 applicants from 25 states. A local restaurant says they fired an employee after that employee attended a rally over the weekend in Charlottesville, Virginia. That rally was met with counter protesting and ultimately resulted in the death of a woman. The president of Mojo Burrito posted a Facebook statement saying they do not condone harassment, racism, or discrimination. It's unclear why the employee attended the rally. We have reached out to him for comment. Last month, a Chattanooga chapter of the NAACP asked for the removal of a Confederate statue from the front of the Hamilton County Courthouse. That statue is of Confederate General Alexander Stewart and was put there in 1918. The NAACP plans to bring up the statue removal again sometime next week with county commissioners. In Tennessee, any statue or memorial must get a two-thirds majority vote from the Tennessee Historical Commission to be relocated or renamed. We're still seeking answers on yesterday's officer-involved shooting on Rossville Boulevard. The Hamilton County Sheriff's Office tells us there's no update on the identity of the suspect involved. An East Ridge Police Department spokesperson says the suspect led police on a chase to a home on South Seminole Drive. Still unclear who shot first or what led to this shooting. The suspect was taken to the hospital and the condition of that suspect is not known. A resident living next door to where the shooting happened said it was a chaotic scene and it's just not the type of activity he's used to in this neighborhood. It used to be such a good neighborhood. You know, kids sleep out in the yard in tents, you know. So, but, you know, it's just changed. 
the officers were not injured and they are being placed on paid administrative leave. Animal advocates hope sharing one of their most severe cases will help spread awareness about resources. This after a dog was found so malnourished, officers say the dog was about to die. Channel 3's Michelle Heron introduces us to Jupiter. And we want to warn you, some of the images you're about to see are disturbing. You can see nearly every bone in Jupiter's body. The three-year-old shepherd mix was nearly half his body weight when officers found him. Several factors come into play. One, you know, his blood level was all over the, you know, all over the scale. And it was just, he was in really poor shape, close to needing a blood transfusion. This is Jupiter now. One week later, he's still very thin, weighing 28 pounds, five pounds more compared to when officers found him. A step HES director Bob Citrillo says is in the right direction. He's much stronger already. He's, he's able to walk more. As we as you saw, he's, he's taking walks now. He's able to go up and down steps. When he first arrived, he couldn't do that. Citrillo says officers discovered Jupiter living in a garage with very little access to food and water. He says a man passed away and his son wasn't able to care for Jupiter properly because he was disabled. An unintentional act, Citrillo says officers often see. It just happened where someone just wasn't able to care for him properly and wasn't able to make sure he was eating when he needed to. It's going to take a while for Jupiter to become healthy enough to be able to be adopted. Right now, Citrillo says they're working on slowly bringing Jupiter's weight up. We have to be very careful how we feed, and so we feed multiple very small meals per day to get him used to eating and getting his belly full again. That was Michelle Heron reporting. If you'd like to help Jupiter, we have more information on how to donate online. And if you or someone you know is in a similar situation, there is help for your family and your pets. We have phone numbers to the Four Paws Pantry and the Humane Educational Society posted on our website. The Whitfield County, Georgia Animal Shelter has a new interim director. The board has announced the Animals Shelter's director, Don Allen Garrett, has retired. This after the news the shelter had been barred from euthanizing animals because of questions about training. The State Department of Agriculture says a veterinarian can still euthanize animals at the shelter. The new interim director in Whitfield County is Diane Franklin. And coming up next on Eyewitness News at 6, Dalton Public Schools will be on an extended day, as many other schools will be, for the Great American Eclipse. <laughs> that means teachers have some safety concerns to work out. Do I need to place them on their faces? Do they, can they place them on themselves and then I check? We'll explain how teachers are making sure those children's eyes will be safe. Scattered showers continue as we speak, uh, moving across the Tennessee Valley. It looks like they'll fade out gradually tonight. We could reform again for tomorrow. I'll give you all the details on my 74.
Channel 3's Total Eclipse coverage is brought to you by Green Forum. Call today to go solar at your home or business. Well, most schools here in Tennessee in our viewing area will be closing during next week's solar eclipse. But in North Georgia, most of the students will be in class. In fact, in Dalton, the students will have a longer school day to witness the event together. A Cleveland business owner donated 9,000 safety glasses to protect the students who are learning why it's important to wear them. Channel 3's Natalie Pod shows us how one classroom is getting ready for the big day. Inside Miss Nix's second grade classroom. That the major orbits around the Earth. Students are learning about the upcoming solar eclipse and how it works. It takes 12 months to, to get the Earth all the way around the sun, so it would take a whole year. Madison and Devin say they're excited to see the eclipse with all of their friends. But when the eclipse happens, the moon is going like, to take over the sun. In Dalton, 99.1% of the sun will be covered by the moon. City Park Elementary will stay after school for an extra 30 minutes to see the sky go dark. Students will head outside to the playground for viewing around 2.15 and stay there until about 2.30. We just started talking about it, showing pictures, explaining how the eclipse works, um, just making models and just really talking about it. And they're excited about the special glasses and so they're ready to try those on. Can you see through them? Nope, nothing but darkness. <laughs> Learning how to wear these safety glasses and keep them on is a top priority. Oh, absolutely. You need to make sure that they know how to put them on. It will depend on the, the students and the grade level. You know, each individual teacher will be looking at the needs of their child. Do I need to place them on their faces? Do they, can they place them on themselves? And then I check. So we're drilled down to the details at the school, at the classroom level. School officials are planning activities and practice drills each day for students and teachers to get prepared. We're having a faculty meeting today that's going to really ramp everything up and talk about how we're going to utilize the glasses, where we're going to uh, go to the playground and view everything. And the kids say they're ready. The solar eclipse, um, the moon gets in between the earth, the earth and the sun. For a spectacular show. That was Natalie Potts reporting. Parents are invited to the City Park Elementary's viewing party. They will have to have their own Eclipse safety glasses to take with them. And our thanks to Cleveland businessman Alan Jones for donating some 40,000 sets of glasses to six area school districts. If you're still looking for Eclipse glasses, Chattanooga's public libraries are giving out 100 pair at each of its four locations Friday starting at 9. You may want to get in line early. Goodwill will give out 200 pair of glasses at each of its Chattanooga, Cleveland, Dayton, and Athens locations on the morning of the eclipse. And if you live between Lenore City and Bradley County, you can get Eclipse glasses at Hardy's starting Saturday. That's uh, coming up with the purchase of a meal. And just a reminder of what schools are out on the day of the total solar eclipse. Take a look at your screen. Catoosa County Schools, Whitfield, Walker, Dade, and Dalton City Schools are all on an extended day. They will stay in school. We have the full list of school changes and closings on our website, WRCBTV.com. I was in Ace Hardware in Red Bank down the street today. They were getting 300 calls per hour. And they're still sold out? They're sold out, hoping yeah. to get more of those glasses. But there's a big demand. Yeah, there is. Still to come at 6, TVA spent the day shocking fish. Mm, that's not what it seems. It simply puts electricity into the water at a low amperage. Electrofishing. It helps the waterways of the Chattanooga area. Chief Meteorologist Paul Bear is keeping an eye on those skies. Right now looking a little ominous over downtown Chattanooga. They'll have seven day forecast next.
A team of biologists hit the water today to check up on the fish that live in the Tennessee River Basin. The study helps them determine if the waterways in our area are healthy. And scientists invited our Channel 3 meteorologist Nick Austin along. Nick donned his waders and explains why it's important to all of us. About every five years, TVA and TWRA get together to go fishing, but it's not for sport. They're electrofishing, collecting samples to determine the condition of the water and protect the animals in it. It simply puts electricity into the water at a low amperage, stuns the fish. Uh, we're able to net those fish up, put them in a some type of holding uh, container. The scientists identify which species they find and in what amounts. This can tell them whether or not the water is in good shape. We look at the, the composition of those species in our, our sample, and um, we also look at the health of the fish, if there's increased uh, parasites or disease. Don't worry, the fish don't die or get hurt. It's a very mild shock for just a few seconds, kind of like the static shock you get when you touch a door handle after walking across a carpet during the winter time. Okay, guys. Clear. Once observed, the fish are placed back in the water. Studies determine the effects, if any, of flooding, drought, A little technical issue there. We apologize for that. We should tell you that more than 500 sites are studied along the Tennessee River Basin. At first glance, the North Chickamauga Creek, where Nick was today, looks good. Now, it's important to note it's illegal in Tennessee to electrofish for recreation. Keep they were mind. doing it for scientific reasons. You got it. Yes. Now it's time to check in with Chief Meteorologist Paul Barris. Paul, we're all talking about Monday. Of course, mm -hmm. we got to get there first, though. That's exactly right. We take it a day at a time right here in the Weather Center. Yeah, what we're looking at right now is some showers up over Grundy County, uh, just south of Whitwell, right through Red Bank, Signal Mountain, the southern end of Signal Mountain, all the way to about Ottawa, and they're pushing down uh, towards the south and to the east, and we've got some pretty good showers moving over Varnell, and then uh, just south of LJ, south of Calhoun, and moving towards Lafayette too, coming right out of Walker County and out over Lookout Mountain, pushing down to the south and the east. And a few showers also all the way out towards uh, Stevenson. There's a cluster of thunderstorms uh, just south of Huntsville. It's pushing off towards the east, but they're fading out as far as the thunderstorm activity goes. And uh, the heaviest rain by far and away is just past Birmingham down towards Montgomery into the Gulf area out near New Orleans. They are absolutely getting soaked out there. Again, we've got some clouds moving in tonight, but they'll leave later on tonight. We're watching a hurricane out in the Atlantic. This is uh, Hurricane Gert, 80 mile an hour winds right now, when it's going to stay out to sea and not affect any land mass at all until it gets closer and closer to Iceland, all the way up there. 88 right now in the city, but it's 90 in Dayton, 88 in Cleveland and Athens, 84 in Dalton. Murphy, 85, winds are lighting out of the northwest. Heat index is 97 right now in Dayton, 95 Athens and in the city, 93 out near Cleveland, 90 in Murphy. 91.74, the high and the low, just a trace of rain at the airport so far. 88 Lafayette to about uh, 90 in Dalton. Four tenths Chatsworth, two tenths out near Fort Mountain in Varnell. A tenth of an inch so far in Scottsboro. We'll get an update at 11 on these rainfall reports. Uh, Trenton about a tenth of an inch of rain. And then 92 in Cleveland, East Ridge and 93 up in Saudi Daisy. About 82 Signal Mountain and 92 up in Pikeville with 93 in Delano for one of the warmer temperatures. Murphy had about a tenth of an inch, and Kegel Mountain hit 86, while Jasper got up to 89. Latest Vipercast shows most of the rain tomorrow morning off to the north, but into the afternoon, things will start popping up once again, 20 to 30% chance, about really about a 25% chance for showers. Uh, Vipercast by seven o'clock on Thursday morning, again, some isolated, widely scattered showers and possibly a thunderstorm, but mainly showers. And then on Friday, a cold front moves in. Once it passes, drier air starts to move in for the weekend. Looks like Saturday and Sunday are going to be dry. But before then, we may see another half inch to maybe three quarters of an inch of rain in spots. It'll be scattered. Tonight, showers ending, very muggy with light winds. Tomorrow, 90, so no surprises there, with some widely scattered isolated showers. And then tomorrow night, 75 with partly cloudy skies. Now, Thursday and Friday, We'll give it about a 30% chance for rain, and as far as the temperatures go, it's going to remain in the 70s for lows, highs near 90 for the next seven days. And even on eclipse Monday, it looks like uh, we'll see some showers late in the day, but they'll be scattered, hopefully south and east of the city. And um, it looks like now we'll have partly cloudy skies at the worst. So it doesn't look like a total rain out, but 
things yeah. are changing. Well, Two thirty yeah. is when it matters, right? Yeah, that's all the that counts. And a lot can <laughs> happen right. in six days. Yeah. Well, you better believe it. We'll keep an you eye can on have it. Six hours. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Coming up next in sports, the mocks are shifting gears at preseason camp. Mm -hmm. And Paul Shaheen just reminded me. It's just 11 days until they kick off on ESPN. Yes, the real deal, ESPN, one week before everyone else. Great exposure for this UTC team. Tom Marth has his gang shifting to game week mentality. Plus, we'll check in with Alabama's leader in the secondary, Minka Fitzpatrick, and the FNF Game of the Week vote. It's shattering past records. We'll tell you about it and how you could still vote next in sports. Tom Arth arrived on campus at UTC in December. It wasn't long after that he had his hands on Jacksonville State game film. The team, not so much, but that is about to change. Next week is game week, but instead of preseason camp running into the weekend, they've ended a bit early in a sense. Arth is calling this week a practice game week. We want our players to get used to, to what, a, what a game week is going to feel like in terms of the, the information that's presented to them, when it's presented to them, how it's presented to them, uh, the types of things we're doing at practice. Um, you know, it'll be very similar to a Tuesday uh, during the season. So, um, you know, we want to really prepare our players for everything, uh, make sure that, you know, they're, they're, they're getting a chance to do it before, you know, before it, before it starts for real. Arth says the mocks are not diving into Jacksonville State stuff just yet, but the process has started. Next week, they will get more in depth. Don't forget, they open up a week early next Saturday, August 26th on ESPN. It's a 6 o'clock kick. Alabama defensive back Minka Fitzpatrick is so talented, coaches are comfortable playing him at any of the six defensive backfield positions. Problem is, he can't play all six at once, but after Alabama's first preseason scrimmage, Minka says the younger defensive backs are coming along just fine. 
we had younger guys and a couple guys who haven't really played a whole lot, but are a little bit older. And uh, you know, we all been working to to build them up, lift them up, and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing on and off the field. And uh, you know, all those guys, they all did what they're supposed to do. They executed when they're supposed to execute. I mean, you you're, you're gonna mess up a little bit when you when you haven't played a lot. I, I messed up a couple times in the scrims as well. So you know, you just gotta build on each other and just keep working. And we're gonna be where we need to be. Alabama's second preseason scrimmage is up this weekend. Scrimmage number one was close to the media and fans alike. Head coach Nick Saban said the offense was inconsistent, which, yeah, means the defense had a better day. Alabama will have the honors of playing the first meaningful football game inside Atlanta's brand new Mercedes-Benz Stadium, September 2nd with Florida State. But we got a sneak peek inside the stadium today. Jill Jelnick was there and says it's spectacular. These are her pictures. A few fun facts. The Halo video board up top there, it's more than five stories tall. You heard right, five stories tall. The Georgia Dome had just 30 beer taps. This stadium has more than 1,200, 1,200 beer taps. We'll have a more in-depth look in the coming weeks. On the prep beat, FNF returns this weekend and you only have a few hours left to vote for our game of the week. We're over 14,000 votes and counting. Right now, McMinn Central has a slight lead against McMinn County. They have the slight lead rather over Cleveland and Ray County, not far behind. On the diamond tonight, the Atlanta Braves are still in Colorado after losing six of their last seven. Last night's was not fun. They're not going to play that video, but I'll Good. tell you, it I'll wasn't fun. <laughs> Julio Tehran threw seven scoreless innings. It was a gem. They wasted it. The bullpen did. Three nothing a loss. But you know, if you can't score any runs at Coors Field, oh, yes. that's pretty scary. Zero zero in the eighth. How mm. rare is that? Oh, but they'll get them tonight, folks. <laughs> I'm an eternal optimist you when are. it comes to the Braves. You are, that's true. Much to the dismay of my wife who thinks I'm crazy. <laughs> that's another story. <laughs> all right, Paul, what's right. the story We'll for check us? the radar. We'll show you these showers. <laughs> They're popping up all over the place, moving in from the uh, northwest down to the southeast. And uh, yeah, some of them are pretty heavy as they're moving, especially into North Georgia right now, still out over Hamilton County, too. Okay. Paul, okay. thank you. Thanks for joining us. And your news continues 24 hours a day at WRCBTV.com. In case you missed it, President Trump had a very uh, interesting press conference this afternoon. NBC News has highlights for you next. No, a couple of weeks ago, yeah, yeah.
Tough news for 222 workers at a paper mill in Calhoun, Tennessee. We're learning more about the job cuts and the people affected at 11. And astronomers explain the amazing science behind the total solar eclipse we'll all see this Monday. Astronomers break down the science behind the total solar eclipse. I'm sure you said See when more showers and storms will pop up in your neighborhood at 11.